From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome inside the ICE house. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. I recently sat down on an airplane returning from a business trip, just me and my Bose noise canceling headphones. As I settled into my seat for my three hour flight back to JFK, I queued up my favorite podcasts. I added one or two new shows that, if interesting, would break into my ever-growing rotation of subscriptions. My listening was soon interrupted by the captain's announcement, you know, the one where he or she says, we've reached cruising altitude, so feel free to move about the cabin. Also, we know you have a choice in airlines, so when you fly on behalf of the airline, I want to thank you for flying with us. The truth is, I could only choose maybe one or two of the 10 major passenger airlines whose flights matched my schedule, so the real choice came not when I purchased my ticket, but while I was waiting to take off. Take out your smartphone now and look at the podcast app. Instant free access to any of the 660,000 active podcasts that offer over 28 million episodes on any topic that think I might be interested in. Seriously, a search of Any person or topic yields tons of choice, though maybe a wide spectrum of quality. It's a far cry from 2011 when I uploaded the first episode of my own podcast called Polyoptics. We had a show on Sirius XM that ran every Saturday and Sunday, but the best feedback came not from broadcasting over a satellite or through the radio, but rather from those who found it on a pod. There's a growing audience of over 144 million people in the United States listening to an average of seven podcasts a week. If you're hearing my voice now, you're one of them. And 2019 is shaping up as a tipping point year for the medium's growth. Anyone who's listened to Alex Bloomberg's startup had to be stunned when Spotify, that's NYSE ticker symbol SPOT, spent a combined $340 million to buy Gimlet Media and Anchor. And when my longtime friend Jacob Weisberg bolted Panoply and Slate for his own startup with Malcolm Gladwell of revisionist history fame to launch Pushkin Industries, well, you could hear the gears of the subscription model starting to turn toward the podcast boom. A favorite of Inside the Ice House and one of the more popular shows to hit the podcast feeds in recent memory is Masters of Scale, Hosted by Reid Hoffman, LinkedIn co-founder and partner at the venture firm Greylock Partners. Our guest today pitched Reid by stating that his podcast would be able to take advantage of his own advice and together they could scale his blitzscaling philosophy. Joining us inside the Ice House are the executive producers behind Masters of Scale, Wait What, co-founders June Cohen and Darren Triff, who will share how they cracked the code of creating unique content and are breaking the podcast mold. What does it take to produce a podcast that stands out in a crowd? What is a content incubator? And most importantly, if you're listening to this podcast right now, it means you're a fan of the medium. Where is this industry headed? We'll find out right after this. Spirit Airlines is a ultra low cost carrier in the United States that is intended to democratize travel, provide low fares and high quality service for the people in the continental 48 and Latin America. We offer a very, very low fare, and in exchange for that, you get an on-time performance that can't be beat. You know, our growth has uh, really catapulted us to this point, and we're extremely proud to be a partner with NYSE. Spirit Airlines, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Our guests today are Wait What CEO June Cohen and Chief Business Officer Darren Triff. The duo were longtime executives at TED before co-founding Wait What in January 2017. June left Hotwired.com to head up media at TED as its fifth employee. She launched TED Talks on the internet, co-founded TED Women, and led the media team to 17 Webbies, 8 iTunes Best Podcast of the Year awards, and a Peabody. 
Darren was responsible for Ted's partnership growth leading to the Ted Radio Hour on NPR, Ted Shows on Netflix, Ted Weekends on the Huffington Post, and Ted in Cinemas, just to name a few. He joined Ted from PBS, where he launched the kids' network, Sprout, as vice president of Digital Ventures. Welcome to the library, June and Darren. Thank you. Thank you. You must get this question over and over again. Are we at peak podcast? Is this tulip mania all over again? Not even close. It's so interesting, you know, when you when you describe 660,000 podcasts, there's a lot of content out there and there's a lot of range of quality. And I think what June and I are most excited about is, is as the technology evolves, where do the production values go and how can you create content that that is of the quality of net, what Netflix is to video. And that's one of the, the pieces, both in terms of creating formats that have never been part of the podcast community and creating sound that um, that is very cinematic and of the quality that you would expect in, in films. I remember having a burger with a guy with an idea, but maybe not enough cash in his wallet to actually buy a burger. I picked up the check. His name was Alex Bloomberg. Does his story give you Monday motivation every week? Well, Alex was a point of inspiration for us, for sure. You know, we were definitely watching his work as sort of colleagues in the field. Um, when we were at TED, Darren pitched us probably eight years ago now, the idea of the TED Radio Hour. And so we went through that creative process together of taking TED Talks and, and turning them along with NPR into a great radio show, which was also a great podcast. And we were watching really closely what was happening in podcasts. So we were listening to Alex from his, from his first episode. And it was that combination of both Alex's work on startup and the podcast serial the, that were those points for us that said, like, there's there's something really important happening there. There's a renaissance happening in podcasting. And going back to your point earlier, when you asked if it's peak podcasting, no, we think we're at the beginning still. We're, we're both at the infancy of the industry and really still in a renaissance, that there's just, there is a flourishing of creative work starting to happen in podcasts. And that's what one of the things that really drives us. If this is just the beginning, then what was that time when TED Radio Hour was being launched, when Alex was doing his first episodes of Startup and Serial burst upon the scene? I mean, what introduced you to the podcast as a format even before that, and what attracted to you it as a marquee storytelling platform? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you look at sort of the early predecessors of what we're seeing today, This American Life and Radio Lab, really interesting content that appeals to people who are naturally curious about the world and interested. And so that was what was appealing to Ted is that the podcast listenership is a sophisticated listenership that's hungry for ideas. What made Startup so interesting is it was a great story, like following Alex's story as, a, as, he, as he tried to put together this business, which he turned into the podcast of putting together the business. Both made it really interesting but of course all wrapped in a story. That was very much what Ted was like. And so we thought it was a perfect match to bring into podcasting. And those were days where it was a lot easier to be downloaded millions of times a month. You have to really fight for those downloads today. Going back into your childhoods, what was the first thing that sort of made your ears sparkle with things that you were listening to? I think that the the turning point for me was I interned at a NPR station in Atlanta when I was 15 years old. And the producer, uh, his name was Mike Bucky. And in those days, you know, you were splicing tape. And he took me into this little studio. It probably was a space of like eight feet by eight feet. And he he was a chain smoker, so he lit up in the studio. So there was 15-year-old Darren <laughs> with Mike Bucky. He's smoking like crazy. The whole the room cloud filled the ceiling. up with smoke. I remember cutting that audio together and hearing what professional audio sounded like. And I remember saying to him, you know, because the, the intern had an opportunity to create a short story that would go out. They, of course, fed it out at like four in the morning. And I was like, how many people are going to listen to my story? And he was like, 5,000. I was like, 5,000 people. And that's, for me, that was where the light bulb went off, uh, producing great storytelling and audio that could have an impact. Okay. 
I'll give you a, a, just a quick note from a different point in my life, which is that when I um, moved to California for college is when I fell in love with radio because you just listen to a lot of radio when you're in your car a lot, which you tend to be when you're in California. And actually, the show that really grabbed me first was perhaps not what you would expect. It was Car Talk. Mm -hmm. And Car Talk is this like perfect example still of what works in audio, which is that, you know, it's two guys <laughs> literally own a car shop talking about cars and taking questions. But their personality, their expertise, their their kind of rapport with each other is what just drew you in. And um, it wasn't fancy, but it was just a great Great personalities and great conversation, which is still at the core, we think, of what makes great audio. Now, we always look to add a lot on top of that. We're always interested in inventing on top of the conversation, on top of the ideas. But at its core, you have to have, you have, to have a host and you have to have people who an audience wants to listen to. So you grew up in California? I actually grew up in New York and moved out to California. Darren, where was, was Atlanta home for you? It was, yes. I hinted at this in the intro, if your industry is going to sustain itself, getting folks to open their Apple Pay wallets probably has to be part of the mix. As recently as 2017, the total revenue for the entire podcast industry was $26 million less than Spotify's investment in creative entrepreneurs like Alex, Matthew Lieber, Michael Mignano, and Nir Zuckerman. Big stars and paid subscriptions, as the New York Times belted out a headline last month, Luminary aims to be the Netflix of podcasts. Where, in your view, does free end and paid begin? Yeah, well, I mean, I think Luminary launches in a couple of weeks now. It'll be really interesting. I think that currently our perspective is that we, we want our content as widely available as possible. And when you work with someone like Reed, who has such important ideas to share, I think we think a lot about about the democratization of media and the ability to reach as many people as possible. And so at this time, it'll be very interesting to sort of see whether the quality coming out of Luminary is that much better than the best co podcasts that are freely available. And I think that's really the question. I have some doubts about it. You know, Audible made a run at a premium subscription business and didn't quite work out. And so, you know, I think it's, we'll, we'll see. Not only are you giving a platform to people like Reed, and we're going to get a lot into Masters of Scale in a bit, but you're helping journalists find, as you said, move from platform to platform. And podcasters are drawn to podcasters like Moth the Flame. I heard Peter Kafka talk to a group of them the other day, including the journalist Bethany McLean, who'll be launching one for Pushkin later this year. I've been hearing it more and more on Brian Koppelman's podcast, for example, great journalists migrating to audio for fear that the print profession is dying. Do you think platforms like yours are their last resort? Oh, I don't think we're anywhere near the last resort in that humans are natural born storytellers. We love to tell stories, we love to hear stories, and we are gonna keep opening up more and more platforms for our stories and ideas to be shared. But I actually think it's really important in media to, to not get locked into a single platform, either as a creator or as a, as a consumer of media. And that's actually one of the things that has really drawn us and, and drives us in our work is thinking not just narrowly about a single medium, whether it's video or whether it's podcasting or whether it's print or text-based media, but thinking across them really broadly. And actually in launching our company, Wait What, we had focused from the beginning not on actually being a podcast company, but rather being a media invention company, that we think about creating content across any different platform and then migrating it from one platform to another. And one of the reasons that we really chose podcasting first is because of what's happening in podcasts right now and has been happening for the last several years, which is that there is a renaissance happening. And one of the reasons behind that, by the way, that we hadn't mentioned yet is that for many years, audio storytelling was 100% the realm of NPR. NPR or PRI, it was all public radio based, and which is fantastic. Like we have like a national treasure in our public radio in America. But what Alex did was he made it entrepreneurial, you know, in the same way that when Elon Musk launched SpaceX, 
right? He took the, the space program and turned it into an entrepreneurial effort. Alex and others, when they started Gimlet, and those of us who have followed, are taking audio storytelling and making it an entrepreneurial effort. And that's a big part of what's allowing it to flourish now, is it's why you're seeing this outpouring of new creativity. I mean, Gimlet, Luminary, Pushkin, and Wait What, all these inventive names, how did Wait What hit you like a ton of bricks, this is what we've got to call it, because I know listening to Alex's first season, the idea of calling it Gimlet was a major issue between him and Matthew. When we started the company, we're a very workshoppy culture, and so everything we do, we have these very interesting workshop formats where we tease out ideas, and we had a workshop, it was actually June's apartment, with colleagues to name Wait What, and Wait What never made it to the board. There was all kinds of names, Wait What was never on the board. But the idea was that we wanted something to make you say, wait, what? Something that would make you stop and rethink something you thought you understood. And so we kept saying, that's the kind of quality we want in the name. And then a week later, I said to June, we should just name it, wait, what? And it really stuck because it's it's done two really useful things for us. One is that it gives us a way to verbalize what we're looking for in content. So every episode of Masters of Scale that we put out, every episode of Should This Exist we put out, we're listening for what we call the wait what moments. Are there enough surprising moments in this episode that will break people out of whatever, whatever they're doing and get them to lean in and say, wait, wait, what did they say? Wait, what's pop? Is that possible? Wait, where did they take that conversation? Like we're always looking for those wait what moments. What's the usual length of a Masters of Scale episode? We actually typically aim for around 30 minutes. They sometimes go a little bit longer when we just can't bear to make enough cuts. The reason for that, it, interestingly, that you know that's that roughly corresponds with the with the broadcast hour, right? Yeah. But it also corresponds with people's lives. Sure. So, you know, commutes tend to be in 30 minute increments. And so we aim for that 30 minute as our sweet spot. How much content do you gather for a 30 minute episode that brings you into the editing suite to, to boil it down to that? For Masters of Scale, we're usually working with a, a 90 minute full length interview with the, the anchor guest, as well as typically around 45 minutes of additional interviews that we're editing down. Then you'd add in on top of that the Reed's analysis and his hosting lines, which probably brings in another 10 to 15 minutes. So there's quite a lot that we're compacting down. And our, our goal in Masters of Scale, as, as well as should this exist, is to really compact the learning so that it sticks with people. So not just to cut it down to that amount of time, but to really distill the ideas and the learning so that it lands with people as they're uh, listening. We think very often interviews kind of wash over people in a pleasant way, but in a way that doesn't stay with them. And we're really aiming to create those wait what moments that will make you lean in and help things to stick with you. And then you also publish the full length interviews as a separate pod. Is that right? Do I remember your feed correctly? Soon. We are uh, where we're planning to release Masters of Scale Uncut in a couple of weeks. And you know, it's really interesting. Our audience has, has really told us that they're really interested in the original conversations between Reed and his guests. And I think it's both because they're just interested in the subject matter and so forth, but there also is this recognition that the guests on Masters of Scale look to Reed very much as a mentor. And you know, he's he's sometimes referred to as the the Oz of Silicon Valley. And they open up to him in a way that they wouldn't open up to tra traditional journalists in that way. And so there's an intimacy in, in these long form conversations that we're we're excited about. So print thrived while there were enough auto dealerships to fill their advertising inventory and enough rental apartments and escort services to fill the classified sections. The advertisers that we hear today on our podcast, ZipRecruiter, Mack Weldon, and of course MeUndies, what happens if their private equity funding runs out before they get a chance to go public here in the New York Stock Exchange to keep these performance ad buys humming? Thankfully, we do not pursue that that category of advertiser. It's really interesting. We, you know, as June described, we think of ourselves as a media invention company. We invented an ad format uh, for Masters of Scale that we've since taken over to Should This Exist, and we call it the three-act ad. And the idea is that inside of companies is, is a great treasure trove of wisdom and insights. And if there are ways to bring those out, what actually the company has discovered that has made internally the company say, wait, what? How do you take that and turn it into a story and open that up to our listenership? And in doing so, we've had listeners, you'll see tons of tweets about listeners rewinding the ads, like who rewinds an ad? 
And for our sponsors, when you look at, you know, Apple now provides the drop-off rates. You can see minute by minute. There's almost no drop-off because our ads are at the produced and created at the same level as the show with the same level of importance. And so that's really been very effective. And so we are not in the game of transactional 15% discount on Blue Apron. We are in the game of telling really interesting stories from companies and having our community actually get actively involved in those companies. How did your first advertiser buy into that concept and the idea that they were going to produce an advertisement over three acts? They actually didn't know it because our first advertiser was ZipRecruiter, which was sold by our partner Midroll. And so they sold, they bought into this thing and then we described what we were doing and they didn't fully understand it until it was, till it went out into the world. And they loved it. So it was the founder of ZipRecruiter who we teased out really interesting ideas around, for example, hiring neglect and that all companies suffer from this very, a very contagious illness called hiring neglect and all in our community totally identified with it. And there was quite a, an outpouring back to ZipRecruiter that they had not seen. So they, they didn't know going in. The point with the ads that we create is that they tease out these ideas and insights, as Darren was saying, that are inside of companies. So it's very much what you already know on this podcast. There are a lot of interesting ideas inside of companies. And so with the CEO of, of ZipRecruiter, it was the idea of hiring neglect. It was the insight that they had that depending on what words you use in a job description, you will get more male or female applicants. It was the idea that the fact that an applicant was fired from their last job might actually be an asset. Like each of those are, are wait want moments. They're things that make you stop and rethink what you thought you knew. And it was super effective for as a recruiter. And actually, truthfully, all of the brands that we've worked with. Well, you are co-executive producer of Masters of Scale as one of your many roles at Wait What. You also recently hosted the two-part episode where Reed took a spin in the guest chair. What's your favorite seat in this recording room? Guest, host, or producer? Honestly, producer. I really enjoy speaking. I enjoy being a guest. I prefer being the host, largely because a lot of my own joy comes out of throwing a spotlight on other people and bringing out their potential. I think that that is really the, the role that both Darren and I love so much of what we're building at Wait What is finding people, whether it's hosts or guests, with extraordinary ideas and potential and throwing a spotlight on them in a way that people can take in. So I'd say that producer overall is my favorite role. Competition is fierce for podcasts looking to find their audience, scale their operations, and demonstrate that they can stand out among a sea of content. So your flagship show, Masters of Scale, how did it find its audience, Darren? Yeah, and it's interesting. It, it, it isn't any one thing, but there's a set of things that we believe deeply in to give a new podcast a chance to break out. And of course, it helps that you have this terrific host who has so much, so, 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 such a um, wealth of ideas. But it's also about creating a format that doesn't exist. And very much as a media invention company, when you're competing against NPR, TED, or others, that those organizations can do, we, at Wait What, we rate everything one out of 10. We rate epi every episode one out of 10, and we rate every segment one out of 10. And you know the well-established companies can put out sixes and sevens and do quite well, but for a new company, you have to put out tens consistently. And in order to do that, we came up with a format for Masters of Scale with these really you know, cinematic cold opens, unexpected cold opens. All the music is originally composed. It takes us six to seven weeks to produce an episode of Masters of Scale. And so there is the way that comedy works, the way Reed talks directly to the listeners with analysis. There's a set of inventions in the format that we think has enabled it to break out. And then there's a whole set of tactics, particularly now and particularly on Apple, there's a whole set of tactics that you have to really look at in a sophisticated way and when to pull those levers to try to chart. And by if you can figure out how to chart, that gives you a chance to sort of have a, a lasting audience and a growing audience. Take me into that pitch room with Reed. How did you sell him on the concept and how patient has he been as a performer and a host? Totally. Well, Reed has been just a delight to work with start to finish. Well, we're not at the finish line yet, start to now. Yeah. You know, we, the idea that we pitched him on was it was based on a couple of notions. And what, you know, one of the things that we always say is that we never pitch people things that we want them to do. We pitch them things that 
we believe they already want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's why Reed, of course, said yes to this. We pitched him an idea to take the ideas he was already developing on scale and to reach more people with them. Reed is very much a natural teacher. He wanted to be a philosophy professor. Any chance he has to play the role of public intellectual or mentor, he leans into with, with all of his might. And so we pitched him on the idea of doing a podcast. The notion of, at the time was that podcasting was a, was a growing medium. There was a widening audience and that it, there was a great audience he could reach. Now, what he'll, he would tell you is that he had no idea what we actually had in mind in terms of the producing. We explained it to him a few times, but I think it was one of the things that you had to hear to kind of completely get what we were, the full package of what we were pulling together with each Masters of Scale episode. And he's loved it. And he has been a delight to work with. It, one of the things that was interesting is is watching him transform into a podcast host. So if you go back and listen to those first few episodes. Do you bring episodes, your gear to him or does he come into a studio or do you do multiple episodes with him at once? Oh, it's a great inside question. One of our secrets to working with people like Reed and all of the guests we've had on Masters of Scale is we go to them. So we record, we have an engineer go to him, we record in his office when he interviewed Reed Hastings of Netflix. He went to the Netflix office for Mark Zuckerberg. He went to the Facebook office. And so we try to get entrepreneurs and executives in the place that is easiest to grab an hour or 90 minutes with them. But it, it, it's a really fun thing to do is go back and listen to those first two episodes of Masters of Scale before Reed had quite gotten his podcast voice. And then you hear by around episode four or five, his like infinite learning capacity kicked in and now he has a whole technique to his podcast narration. I mean, he was not a unknown figure before he started, but he must give you incredible insight into the feedback that he gets from his community and how it has sort of opened up new doors for him or made him seem more approachable or brought new opportunities to, to Greylock Partners. I think some of the broader things I would let him speak to, but we, we do hear that from him all the time and from our audience, that by having this regularly occurring podcast, the breadth of the audience that he is able to reach and mentor with this podcast is is immense. And and really the, the goal in it for all of us was to take his ideas and to help democratize them. As Darren said earlier, this kind of the democratization of entrepreneurship through the show is something that really drives him and us as well. I and mean, that's one of the things I get from Brian Koppelman listening to him. He used to be, for me, just a guy who wrote scripts to movies and started billions, but now you listen to enough episodes of the moment, he becomes a great mentor to, you know, to people sort of striving for more creativity. Totally. And we hear from people in our audience all the time. We got an email from last week, an email from a guy who lives in Angola and he uh, launched a, a ride sharing uh, startup. They won startup of the year in Angola. And he wrote this long letter in to read, thanking him for giving him the courage, like the tools and the courage to take the leap into entrepreneurship. And that's why we do what we do is letters like that. So that's Reed, but when you're developing a new podcast, do you start by identifying a storyteller you want to work with and then build a podcast around them, or do you find the right host after developing the idea that you want to pursue? Well, our second podcast, Should This Exist, it's interesting. I think that we look at a lot of signals coming at us at the same time from different places. And with this one, we were, June and I were at the MIT Media Lab meeting with Joe Ito. And he was, we were talking about sort of the idea, so, much, so many interesting things are coming out of tech labs and incubation spaces, all this radical technology that we have no idea what it would do. And you know, Joey said, you know, the, 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 the last thing we wanna do is like a tech cast where you're just reporting stories that are coming out of the lab. What's really interesting is looking at the implications of what this technology is doing to us or for us. And that conversation, within the next two weeks, there were three or four other conversations completely unrelated that were all looking at this question of what is technology and its impact on humanity. And that was how that was born. And it happened to be that Katerina Fake, uh, the founder of Flickr and really very much part of the a, a godmother, a godmother of the internet, reached out to us wanting to host a show along these lines. And so we were like, well, we have to create this show, and we did. Uh, we're, we're launching the fifth episode on Thursday. Going back to before Should This Exist, before Masters of Scale, before you started Wait What, 
there was Ted. Technology, entertainment, design. That simple idea has given birth to a planet full of content. Reflect on what Ted has done for our collective wisdom. Gosh, that is a great question. The way Darren and I intersected at TED, I joined TED as employee number five when TED was just a conference. The quick version of it is I, I launched TED Talks online and grew that to around 100 million views around the world. And Darren joined five years later. We were sort of, he was the scale up side of TED Media and I was the startup side of TED Media. And so I had grown TED Talks to around 100 million views and Darren came in and grew it to around 100 million views a month. So much of our time at TED was spent thinking about how do you take these great ideas and spread them around the world. And I think that TED has done, um, the, the TED and specifically the spread of TED Talks and all of their forums around the world have done a few things. I think that it has reignited in us an understanding of, a, a very broadly an understanding of an appreciation, the importance of, of oral storytelling and the, the, the ability to share your ideas in a public way, which now seems obvious, but it really was a completely forgotten art at the time that TED Talks launched online. People didn't talk about public speaking or about the sharing of ideas in, in a sort of a, an, an oral form. I, I don't remember people ever talking and about that And it's sort of in narrowed to stand-up comedy in, in some ways about people's ability to stand up on a stage with one spotlight on them and go through things that would make us laugh but also make us think. That's right. When we were launching TED Talks, when I was pitching the idea both internally, I was the one who pitched the idea of putting TED Talks online and took it out to first TV stations and then others, there was literally I cannot think of a person who thought it was a good idea like it just seemed like a very bad very small idea the idea that anyone would want to watch taped lectures was absurd um, because first of all nobody likes lectures and second of all nobody will watch anything taped that's then on video and thirdly no one watches anything online that's longer than three minutes all of which are of course false and so one of the things that we really tried to do with it was take these incredible thinkers and doers, right? Professors, authors, architects, builders, and celebrate them and turn them into rock stars. And when we first started talking that way, no one understood what we were talking about. Like we would even say to the filmmakers or the videographers at the conference, we want you to shoot it like a concert. We want you to turn that professor into a rock star. And they, we would just get a lot of eyes rolled at us. But now TED Talks really has created its own form. It's its own genre. That sort of mindset is really what we're bringing to everything at Wait What as well, of sort of how do we create a new genre? How do we create new genres that, that light people up in that way, that give them a new way of thinking about ideas, a new way of sharing ideas? Darren, June gives you a lot of credit for scaling it as large as it was. How did that happen? Well, uh, Ted, <laughs> I walked in at the right time. You know, I mean, there's, Ted had this incredible library, and it was largely living on TED.com and on YouTube. And so it was a, you know, I, I looked at it as a blank slate. I think what was really most interesting to me was um, not just setting up distribution channels for the talks, but looking at the talks as something that could be reimagined into different forms, looking at the transcripts, looking at the audio. And so when you listen to TED Radio Hour and you hear those talks sound designed, they come to life in an entirely different way than on the stage. And when you group two or three of them together around a theme and you start to get that kind of circle of point-counterpoint, you understand them differently. And that's very much the way we think about, wait, what? We, we actually, Masters of Scale is actually not a podcast. Masters of Scale started as a podcast. And ultimately, the success of it is that what it becomes could become much greater than than that first format. And we think it's super interesting to start in that format, but it's not the end of that of that property. Who or what did you both turn to as a roadmap for what you wanted to build at Wait What? Were there people that came across your radar through your TED experience and helped you figure out how to go from where that was to what you would eventually become at Wait What? Let me start with a, th a thought that kind of sits next to this idea that you're, or the question that you're asking, which is that in, in everything that we create at Wait What, we, we tend to think about media really differently from other people in, in media. And so we don't, when we're, with everything that we create, we don't think about, for example, the demographics of who we're trying to reach. We don't think about it in those terms. What we think about instead is how we want people to feel. So in everything that we create, we want people to feel 
contagious emotions. We want everything to evoke the contagious emotions of curiosity, wonder, awe, mastery, both because those are emotions that light you up and help you reach your potential. It's the world we want to live in, but also because those emotions have a kind of a secret strategy to them. Those contagious emotions make you want to share. When you have that sense of curiosity, wonder, awe, mastery, you want to share with other people. And that's been scientifically shown in many different studies. And so that's one of the key things that we really focus on in everything we create. And coming back to your question of who inspires us, we think a lot about who evokes that emotions in us, who makes us feel a sense of curiosity, wonder, awe, mastery, and how do Mm -hmm. we work with them? How do we bring them on as a host, as a storyteller, as a guest? Some people have that gift of lighting up other people, and that tends to be who we focus on when we think about creating something new. You also produced an anonymous podcast in Sincerely X. This brought to light the ideas and stories of people who had a chance to stay secret, which is sort of different than the people who would light up a room with their own personality. What did the genesis of creating the series and what did it teach you about being able to only profile content, but not the creators itself? So it's actually a pretty funny story because Sincerely X was, I pitched that to Chris after TED Radio Hour. And the thinking was, what, because I loved audio, and the thinking was, what could we do in audio that he couldn't say no to? And the only idea was, well, a not anonymity, because you couldn't see who the, <laughs> who the speaker was. Right. So that is actually where the idea came from. What could we do in audio that can only be done in audio? But then it evolved as we started to think about it. It really evolved into creating a platform for people that would otherwise never be on the TED stage because they had an interesting story to tell, but they didn't want other people to know for different reasons. And that interesting story, of course, was rooted in an important idea. And it was really interesting because when we, when we did an open call for Sincerely X, that really did democratize TED. When you look at the kinds of people that applied, they were in coming from all kinds of challenging situations and circumstances. They weren't accomplished academics or artists or or they were people that had an experience that transformed them and in that experience was a really important idea. And this was the only platform that they could share it safely. And that's why that show sounds so different. We're really proud of it. So on the other end of the spectrum, there is Masters of Scale and it features the A-list lineup of guests. And of course, as a As a podcast explorer, I can't help but also sampling the new offerings from Will Ferrell in his Anchorman personality or Conan O'Brien with Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend, where he takes off this sort of late night blitz of a a host and tries to get real with some of the guests. So compared to Sincerely X, are audiences gravitating toward star power or are they interested in learning about up and comers and having ideas without necessarily big names attached? I think there's always room for both. You know, one of the things we often found, for example, when we were running a TED conference is that when you have the big names, the big names might be what initially draw people in, but it was the unknown speakers that would captivate them, that would turn out to be their favorites. And we think in everything that we create, we aim for both. We aim for people who have some some built-in base and, and a name value and, and attractors to them. So there's Masters of Scale with Reed Hoffman and We've had guests like Mark Zuckerberg and Reed Hastings and so on. What really works in audio is authenticity, right? And there is something really unique, not just in audio, but in podcasting where you're, you're, the, the person you're listening to is literally in your ear. Mm-hmm. It is so intimate that really what works best is, is authenticity and intimacy and human stories. And if you can manage that, whether it is with someone you have never heard of, like one of our guests on Sincerely X that no one had ever heard of but had an idea they wanted to share without even using their own name, to one of the best known you know, celebrities or entrepreneurs around, it always comes down to authenticity. You mentioned the intimacy in the ear, June, and I wonder if sort of the march of technology has also helped podcasting along. It's a much better experience totally mobile, walking around anywhere, taking your dog for a walk, doing housework, but having great fidelity in your ear. Technology helping you a lot? It's really important, and and it's particularly important for us where, you know, music plays a really important role in what we're creating. Most podcasts, and particularly early day podcasts, were, were talk, spoken word only. 
and when you're composing original music, you think of music as, a, as actually a central character in the storytelling. We'll be announcing shortly a podcast that probably couldn't happen without the ability to, to do binaural audio and to create an, a sound experience and a musical experience that creates a somatic response in the person. And so um, mm. that's an example where we're, we're actually leaning into the technology that two years ago we couldn't have created this podcast. Why is a format often compared to talk radio so popular among this tech-savvy generation that is following Reid Hoffman? I think the answer just all points to like this moment in time and what's changed, right? So one of the things that has changed and we're still seeing the impact of it, I mean, we're 10 years into the smartphone, but that impact still has these rolling effects on us, right? So our ability to carry content with us, to have it on demand, the introduction now of, of smart cars where you can easily bring podcasts into your driving experience if that's how you commute, the technology has brought us to this point. I think that building on that is this moment where there is so much entrepreneurial energy combining with the creative energy of storytellers in the space. But again, I, I really do think we're only at the beginning. There is so much headroom in terms of what could be done on the technologies, the platform, and the content. We, we really are just at the beginning of podcasting. Only at the beginning of podcasting. After the break, Darren and June will explain the genesis of Wait What and how it is a first-of-its-kind content incubator. That's right after this. Our mission is to bring the world together through live experiences. We're focused on building a technology enablement platform for event creators, lower the friction and cost of creating an event, and increase the rate of success for event creators all over the world. We're a global inclusive company in 11 different countries. This really marks a new chapter for Eventbrite and it feels like the starting line. Eventbrite now listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Welcome back. Before the break, Wait What co-founders June Cohen and Darren Triff were discussing all things podcast from why the format is effective to how it will best be monetized. On why the format is effective, people are interacting with their podcasts in so many different ways. Tell me some of the stories that people tell you about how the ability to absorb content, good content, whether it's yours or anyone else's, sort of gives them so much more flexibility in their lives. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that one of the things that that draws us to to the medium and to the format is when you, I'm sort of, it's a little bit adjacent to, to what you asked, but when you look at the, you know, one of the, one of the stats that's important is listen through rate. Right? How long are people actually listening to your content? And now on Apple, you can see when people drop off. And our shows, you know, Master Scale has an 85% listen through rate for a 40 minute episode. Like, you, you don't see those numbers on YouTube. And does that allow for stops and starts if they want to only do half of it now and finish the next does. step? It does. It does. It's recognizing that IP address and it's looking at, at, their, at their totality of their listen, listen through rate. But I think that what's, what's so interesting is that there's a, there's a podcasting habit that's very much built into commute and built into working out and other kinds of things where you don't, you know, you don't need to use your eyes particularly. And that's created this, this opportunity to create really impactful, really meaningful content that people are paying attention to. They're deeply listening to it because of this sort of lifestyle habit. And in fact, it led us, you know, we struck up a partnership with Harvard to adapt their famous business cases into an audio-driven business case, which we call the pod case. And the entire reason for doing that is because their student, their listening habits are to learn through podcasts. And so adapting to that impacts the learning experience. We mentioned the influx of capital in the industry. Certainly Spotify's acquisition of Gimlet is sort of the biggest headline of the last couple months, but how will that change the entrepreneurial aspect of the way this industry has grown up so far, the large money, is that going to bring better or different types of producers and storytelling into the industry and anything to be mindful or worried about as more money comes in? We're already feeling the effects of, of Spotify's acquisition of Gimlet. We were, we were closing our Series A round. We were, it was in two different tranches. And the second piece of that was closed right after the, the Gimlet announcement, and it happened within a week, right? And so it really, I think that capital flowing into really great content creators and podcasting is going to 
increase the quality of the content dramatically. And I think that, you know, when when Spotify, as they build out their podcasting offering and as Pandora does the same, and and of course there's there's also Himalaya and some really interesting opportunities to take podcasts in the United States and and grow them abroad, particularly in China. I think you're gonna see you're really gonna see a greater differentiation between the premium content, the super differentiated premium content, and then, every, then there's everything else. And I think that's that's been made possible because it's now a serious industry. Monetizing podcasts has increasingly become a topic of contention with factions forming around a few different models. We've talked about some of them. Wait, what podcasts are free to subscribe? Did you explore a paywall model? And do you think that the industry is moving in that direction? You know, we've been approached by by the different companies that are that are offering content behind a paywall. We at this time have decided not not to participate for the reasons that we shared earlier to, to make. You know, it's very similar to our ethos at TED is to is is the best way to have an impact and the best way ultimately to scale and have enduring value is to be as accessible as possible. And so that's that's a decision we've we've made. You know, I think there's a mar- market there for paid content. Clearly, Netflix there's a you know there's a market for paid paid content. But I think June and I both believe that it's 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 both. It's not it's not and or. When will brand advertising come into the picture? My ears hearing the jingle "Have a Coke and a Smile" or something like that. While I listen to a break between halves of your next podcast, it's it's already beginning. So I think in the next you know we'd we'd probably say in the next two years, it's going to be much more widespread for brands to be advertising in audio with an eye toward brand building as opposed to just driving immediate sales. Because audio and radio had lived almost entirely within the realm of of public radio, there actually was a sort of an, an underdevelopment of brand advertising until now. So what we find is that when we talk to the partners we bring in, part of the value we're bringing to them is not just the end product of these three act ads, but also the insights we've learned along the way about what works in audio, why people respond to uh, particular ads in a particular way. I think it is really exciting what's beginning to happen in brand advertising. And it's really an extension of what's happening in, in audio storytelling overall. The way the podcast industry is growing up offers the ability to sort of short circuit a lot of legacy industries that are burdened by their past. I mean, June Masters of Scale was launched as the first podcast to promise an equal 50-50 gender breakdown. And you've sought out to both have a diverse staff and also diverse investors. What advantages does this give Wait What? We think it actually gives us really pretty extraordinary disruptive powers in the industry for all kinds of different ways. As you said, we are committed to roughly 50-50 gender balance. I say roughly 50-50 gender balance to acknowledge the fact that there are many people who are gender fluid, and so you can't have an exact 50-50 breakdown. But we don't shy away from the idea of of a rough quota there for many different reasons. And we aim for this 50-50 balance in our team, among our investors, ultimately on our board, and also in the media properties that we create. And there's a number of different advantages that it brings, and part of that comes from the natural balance of perspectives. So we believe generally that organizations are strongest when they have a diversity of perspectives coming in. And that's not just on the gender front, it's in terms of ethnicity, it's in terms of cognitive styles, the way people learn, backgrounds, languages spoken. The more insight you can get from your team and the people surrounding you, the better you can serve your your audience. And there are many, many examples of times when we'll find that there's a, a split of opinion on our team that is unexpectedly along gender lines, things that you would not think were gendered turn out to be gendered. And that could range from things like how you prefer to have a conversation to how a particular logo looks to you to how you respond to a piece of music. And it's often not in the stereotypical ways you would think, it's ways that are much more nuanced. And the more voices you have around the table, the better you're able to identify what's going to speak to a broad audience and to which segments. How many people are are at Wait What right now? We're still tiny, we're 12. Where are you getting most of your team from? Where are you drawing them from? 
really open. I mean, we do open searches for every position that we have. And the truth is most of the people we're hiring do not come from an audio background. Most of them have really deep skills in other areas within storytelling and a deep sense of like curiosity and are sort of attracted to the new. Everyone we bring to the team is sort of a natural born inventor. And so they have that quality to them of, of a love of kind of discovering new things. And so that makes the switch into audio a seamless one, but it also al- it allows us to create, we think, podcasts that don't sound like everybody else's podcast because most people on our team are sort of bringing a beginner's mind to what they're doing. Do you mostly find yourself together in the same place, concentrated in one workspace to look across the table at each other, whiteboard ideas, collaborate, you know, in person, or are you able to do this virtually and in different spots? So our our office is here in New York, but we actually spent half the week outside of New York. Several of our team members, for example, the writer of Masters of Scale is based on the West Coast. We lean heavily on video conference. We're a very video conference culture. A lot of that we picked up at, at TED. And we use Slack, and, and the, I think the tools today really allow you to stay connected throughout the day, and that also allows us to tap into talent that doesn't live in New York, doesn't want to live in New York. We have a very progressive perspective about that. Masters of Scale, Darren, has been described as the prototype for the company's content incubator. What is the business model that you want to launch? We think a lot about, we use the, we use the term horizontal scaling at Wait What, and what we mean by that is that if you create a really excellent body of content that is evergreen, and when, when we say evergreen, evergreen in the sense that when we create every episode of Master Scale, it's tied around an idea, it's not tied around a moment in time, and so it endures over time. And once you create that body of content, you're able to reimagine that into different products and experiences. And we're in the process right now of taking Masters of Scale and turning it into several different educational products the Harvard podcast being one, but several other ones. We are imagining publishing opportunities around that content because the transcripts are so rich. We are about to embark on a live, a live event experience for Masters of Scale that will be as innovative as the podcast itself and enable us to get much closer to our community. And as we kind of look ahead to some of the newer podcasts in this one coming up in June, there are opportunities for us to be in really interesting places like planetariums and museums and in the airport lounges and really interesting ways of distributing that are outside the podcast app world. When I met you guys on the floor of the exchange a few weeks ago, we immediately made a connection between Harvard Business Publishing, Josh Mocked, and what you were doing with the pod cases. I don't think we've talked about it on the show yet, but explain what a pod case is. So Harvard, since 1925, I believe, used the case method of teaching to create business cases, which essentially are the stories of companies working their way through a complex challenge. And the business cases are made available, sold into universities, and, and they become, they've really become sort of the preeminent tool for teaching business students. But they are very long, and the format is arduous, and it, you know, they're dense and requires a lot of reading and, and, and so forth. And so what we've done with Harvard is we've leaned into this particular pedagogy, the, the case method of teaching, but basically reworked an episode of Masters of Scale to map to that business case format. And the students are able to both read and listen, and both before class, but also listen during class and then have the same kind of conversation around it. And so it's really been a breakout opportunity for, for Harvard in terms of creating a business case format that matches the listening habits, of their, the media habits of their students. What's the number one metric that you guys use to determine if an original series is a success? And how long do you let new content vehicles sort of find their audience before you say, let's, let's go back into the editing room and make some changes to try and make this model pop a little bit more? The first one is simply reach. How many people are we reaching with it? Whether it's downloads, whether it's listens, whether it's views. We think there's a a real importance to sticking to objective and quantitative goals with something. How many people are you actually reaching? And that's important to us because we want to create great culture changing media that really scales to a very wide audience. So 
numbers is one. But the second one is passion in the audience. So we really look for in the in social posts, in emails that we hear, and any feedback from our audience, are we hearing superlative language? Are we hearing people say it's their favorite, that they're in love with it, that they're obsessed with it? Are we hearing that people are grateful, that they're so happy to have this podcast or this media format? So those are two things we look for, both the numbers, but also the just the quality and the depth of the audience response. As we wrap up, what are the podcasts outside of the Wait What family that are on both of your must-listen-to podcast feeds right now? I'll give you two with with great love. One is just The Daily from The New York Times. I love the show and also just love the way The New York Times has embraced the new medium. And I, I, you know, I believe when The New York Times wins, we all win. Not everybody feels that way, but I do. I love seeing what they're doing in new media. And then the second one is a little more obscure. I love the show Heavyweight from Gimlet. And it's just one of these shows that captures like a really authentic, intimate storytelling and great host, really surprising storylines. Not a famous person on it, just great surprising storytelling. I would say too many to list. So you mentioned that you finished your Series A round recently as the Spotify Gimlet deal was being announced. Why is Wait What set up to thrive in the current podcast environment? What do you still need to get into place over the next few months and years to position and condition your company to thrive? We are betting on premium being a premium differentiated house of brands, so to speak. And it plays into our strengths and it plays into the kind of world that we want to live in. And so from our view, what we want to do is create content that for which there are no precursors to the format of the content we're creating and to work very strategically with partners to introduce that content into the world. You'll notice that whenever we launch a new, a new property, we don't do it alone. We have a culture of collaboration and we're always looking for the right kind of organizations that can build around our content and introduce it into the world. So Should This Exist is not just a podcast, but there's a whole editorial program and through our partnership with Quartz that amplifies each episode and those kinds of things we think ultimately will enable us to succeed and in terms of what we need, we have, we have 12 positions open. <laughs> we need people, really good people that have a real capability to invent. So the producers of Masters of Scale, Should This Exist, June and Darren, thanks so much for joining us inside the ISS. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. That's our conversation for this week. Our guests were Wait What's co-founders, June Cohen and Darren Triff. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Pete Ash and Teresa DeLuca with production assistance from Ken Abel. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 